Hello and welcome to Getting Active with a Chronic Condition. And my name is Natalie Watson. I work for Camden ICOPE and I'm going to be presenting today with my um, colleague Spiro. Hi, I'm Spiro and I work with Natalie in Camden ICOPE. Welcome to our workshop. So um, when people come to the surveys, we do ask them to complete some questionnaires. That's just for us to they understand where the difficulties might be for people and which is why we're asking you to fill both an anxiety and low mood questionnaire. Um, and although ICOPE is not a crisis service, there are services that offer support for people that are in urgent need. On the screen we're offering a few options including Samaritans and the crisis line which are both 24-hour services you can contact anytime. Okay, so just a few little bits of housekeeping to get you used to how it's going to work today. So we're hopefully going to be running a 90 minute workshop today. Um, we, if you're in the workshop with us, we ask you to keep your cameras on unless you're experiencing broadband issues. Um, we are going to have, we are more than happy for you to stretch and move around if you need to. We appreciate that sitting in front of a computer screen for a long period of time can be quite difficult. So do not worry about just getting up and moving around if that's what you need to do. Um, there is a chat function if you're live with us and feel free to type any questions you have as you go along. We will be checking the chat box at regular intervals and we'll be trying to answer questions as we go along. So feel free to put things in there. Um, depending on how you're viewing us, there will be a couple of different options as to whether you're looking at the screens or whether you're looking at the group. Feel free to switch between whichever of those you feel is most comfortable. Um, again, if you're live with us, we would ask you to mute your microphones while Spiro and I are presenting. It just means that it, it reduces the background noise for everybody else involved so we can all hear what's going on. Um, and the other thing is that we are going to have regular what we call fidget breaks again. So again, it's just like a chance to stand up, move around, do whatever you need to do to make sure you're comfortable. So make sure you use those as well. OK. Thanks, Natalie. And if you're live with us, um, there's a few ground rules we wanted to agree with you together. Um, so um, there's a few of us today um, in the workshop. So we will all be asking you to keep confidentiality. This means that uh, whatever you hear from people's experiences, names, uh, faces to keep to yourself, not take any, any pictures or videos uh, outside of the workshop. Um, if you can, please turn off your phones or put them on silent. And just a general rule, if somebody's speaking, to please uh, wait for the person to finish before before speaking. Um, as for, there's a few of us, and we do have to keep some time. Um, we will be asking you to please um, uh, help us by keeping it short. Uh, we'll be possibly advising you to stick for stick for a certain amount of time, like maybe 10, 20 seconds each, especially in group discussions as well, just to keep the flow of the workshop um, in a good way, and uh, so that people can all share their experiences. So what are the aims of today? We, When we were designing this workshop, we thought we wanted to have three main aims for what we were going to look at today. So we are going to spend a very short amount of time reviewing the benefits of exercise or physical activity for long term health conditions. We are also hoping to discuss some of the barriers that we all face, not only as humans, but particularly humans with long term health conditions and how that can impact our day to day life and particularly our relationship with physical activity. And we're hoping to start having a conversation about those barriers and maybe problem solving some of them so we can talk about how we can overcome them as we're moving forward. OK, so who are we? So my name's Natalie Watson. Um, I'm a trainee health psychologist within Camden ICOPE. Uh, that means that I'm studying and treating the link between physical and mental health. Um, I've also got a long history of community sports engagement, so I'm very passionate about helping people exercise in a way that they enjoy. I work as a martial arts instructor, I work at a climbing wall, and I'm also a health and wellness coach for Crystal Palace Football Club. So um, exercise and physical activity is a big part of my daily life. And I'm Spirit Artis. I work with Natalie in Canada Michael. Um, so my role is, uh, is being a psychological well-being practitioner. This means that I work with people that have difficulties with low mood and anxiety. And part of my role is um, working with people that have long-term conditions and helping them overcome some difficulties with anxiety and low mood and managing their conditions. Um, and that's also one of my, my interests as well, just um, finding out ways to help people that do have um, a chronic condition. 
um, I might be a bit less experienced uh, than Natalie in terms of uh, engaging community activities, but I'm equally interested, and which is why we created this workshop today. Okay. So I guess the first question that we need to ask is when I say the word exercise, and I will use exercise and physical activity intermittently throughout this workshop, I personally find that when I say exercise to people, particularly in communities, people start panicking and we start thinking about gyms and weightlifting and being very uncomfortable and we think about things that we don't necessarily enjoy. So I just want you to take a moment and reflect on what do you think of when I say the word exercise? How does that make you feel? Um, and that's hopefully something that we're going to talk about today. So there is we do put all physical activity on a spectrum so depending on how active we are being depends on where we sit in the spectrum so we have like if we are sleeping um if we're over in this section obviously we're not doing anything physical activity wise but as we slowly move up so working from home at the moment we're all finding our lives quite sedentary we're sitting quite a lot at computers and desks so we're not doing that much activity Standing and walking about counts as light intensity, so things that move the body but don't really engage our cardiovascular system particularly. Then we move up into moderate intensity, so this is things like when we're going walking with our friends, doing things that are engaging our body and requiring us to use muscles. And then right at the far end is what people tend to think of when we say exercise. These are the things that really get your heart rate going, make you lose your breath, and these counts as vigorous activity. So these are your things like your running, your weightlifting, and your gym visits. So again, we're hopefully going to talk about all the different things in the middle between this that we can engage in. Okay, so um, how much of this physical activity do we actually need to do on a daily basis? So according to the UK medical chiefs, we need to do about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. So that's the walking about um, level of activity in a week. But this can be broken down into durations of 10 minutes. We're not asking you to go out for, an, for a two hour walk every day. It's just a, a period of time you can break it down and fit it into your schedule however you like. Or they say 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. So this is your running and your gym going about 75 minutes of that a week or a combination of both. However, you decide that you want to engage in, in physical activity is completely up to you. And that's something we're going to be talking about a lot today. Um, we should also be looking at things called muscle strengthening acti activities. So these are things like carrying your shopping home, being able to walk up and down stairs, all these things that strengthen the muscles that hold our bodies together. Um, we should limit the time we spend sitting, which, again, as someone who's been working from home for the last six months, I, I laugh whenever I say because I don't seem to leave this chair. Um, but we should be trying to stand up at regular intervals. And that's something that we're going to be trying to model today. So bear with us while we work through that. And again, if you're over the age of 65, the government also recommends that you spend some time practicing balance and coordination activities. Now, obviously, I'm not an expert on, it, on all of this. So if you go to this link here, you can find some really great resources that have been put together by people far more knowledgeable than me about all the different types of groups that we have and different exercises that you can engage in at that level. OK, so coming back to this idea, what counts as exercise? Oops. I want you to have a look at this at this slide and I want you to have a think about what on this slide would you have put there if I said, OK, think about all the things that mean exercise to you. How many of these things would you have put on? Uh, how many of these things would you have selected? There are so many different things that count as physical activity that we don't even think about going shopping with our friends, being able to spend time like playing with our children in a park. And even climbing the stairs every day, all of these things count as physical activity that we are engaging in. Spending time in your garden, again, is excellent for your body. You'll get to move around, you lift tools if you're digging or, or weeding or watering your plants. You're giving your body an excellent workout. So it's, it's noticing that these things are, are count as physical activity and engaging them in our, diary, in our diaries a little bit more. Oh, can't come out of this. Okay. Now we'll be talking a bit more about why exercise can be helpful for people. You have to, and now we're asking you to have a think about how exercise can be helpful to you as well. So if you're like with us, we will be, uh, we will be asking you to please share with us a few things you, you um, notice um, exercise could be helpful with. Um, if you're watching us from, from a stream, um, just take a moment and think about 
some things, some reasons why you think exercise can benefit your, your life, but exercise and physical activity in general. Okay. So hopefully you've had a quick second to just have a think about things that you think might be useful for exercise. So there are a couple of biological things that are are specific to exercise and their benefits on our body. Uh, one of those things is that is um, the role of systemic inflammation. So if I say systemic inflammation to you, you probably don't really know what I'm talking about. But if I say bruising, you would probably understand that. So inflammation is what happens when our body heals us, heals itself. So if we find that we've strained a muscle, we might notice that that muscle, that that joint area will expand slightly while the blood flows. So it can bring the nutrients to heal that part of our body. That's inflammation and inflammation is actually very good for healing. However, if we're living with a long term health condition, we can find ourselves at inflammation which is where this joint swelling or these muscle areas they don't stop being inflamed which can lead to there being extra fat in the blood and could lead to us to having longer term conditions like heart conditions later on so there are studies that suggest that physical activity does help reduce that level of systemic inflammation however people can go the other way and make it a lot worse by not allowing their body time to recover so that's a really important part of this talk. We need to talk, make sure that we are taking time for our bodies to recover from everything that we are putting them through. Um, there are also some neurological changes that people that have been noticed with regular exercise. So there are changes to the brain connectivity, particularly in relation to things like stress and anxiety. Um, studies have shown that regular exercise can change the brain, um, the brain structure and can help you deal with stress and anxiety slightly better. I mean that the impact is slightly body okay so there are some studies there is a reference here if you want to go and have a read um but also the cochrane library is also very good at putting language in put explaining summaries in accessible language so if you don't want to read science papers you can go and have a look at the same papers in more accessible language at the cochrane library okay and now we wanted to think about how else can exercise be helpful um, just take some time and have a think about how do you think exercise can be helpful to you for your life and beneficial for you and what can, kind of things come up for you. Um, so just take a moment and think about what sort of things you could exercise can be helpful with. So going back to the idea of the benefits of physical activity, um, we have collated a few ideas that came up from research and people's experience. So exercise can be very helpful uh, in improving my well-being. Um, it can also be a very sociable activity. Um, it can provide distraction as well, and um, it does add up to a healthier lifestyle. So um, because of the movement, um, our blood flow is, is better, which means that oxygen runs better to the, to the muscles in our bodies. And so that means that our concentration and cognition can, can be improved. Um, it does provide a sense of achievement as well and release some of the stress and anxiety that we might have daily. Um, it can be quite sociable because it does allow us to maybe do things with other people, maybe friends or even other people that we don't really know. Um, and more likely than not, you might do this outside the house. Um, it can provide distraction because um, it does take your mind off of things. You might be concentrating on what you're doing and it can also uh, help you with managing cravings and uh, withdrawal symptoms. And it does provide um, a bit of overall well-being in terms of healthy lifestyle. Um, it can improve our mood, uh, regulate sleep and appetite, uh, it, it improves mobility as well, and reduces stiffness and pain, as I to explain um, in terms of inflammation. So um, now is a good time to think about barriers to exercise. What, what would you say we're less likely to engage in physical activity in our daily lives? What are things that might be impacting us. Um, okay, so I think a personal one for me um, is I notice that when my life gets particularly busy and I have a lot on at work, exercise tends to be the thing that I think I can just put off and I can just do later. So it tends to be the thing that I don't prioritise particularly. Yeah, and same for me. Sometimes when I do have a very busy week, uh, it's one of the things that I let go first. Um, but 
um, when I do do this, um, I do notice that it has an adverse impact in my life. Um, I do find that it does provide me with a little bit of respite from my busy schedule and also I do feel more energetic when I exercise regularly. Okay, so we've come up with some quite interesting suggestions about reasons why we struggle particularly with exercise. Um, but the, when this was, re was researched in 2016, they came up with six major issues, particularly for people with long-term health conditions. Um, so we are going to look at these six in a little bit more detail as we go through. But the idea that how we're feeling can impact how we're, ex um, how we're engaging with exercise. So again, when we're stressed, when we're feeling quite depressed, it's very hard to go out, of, go out and do some exercise. Again, if we're feeling that we don't have support from our friends, our families, our medical professionals, it can be really hard to engage in this kind of routine. And as we as both Spira and I mentioned, the idea that when we're busy, exercise isn't seen as that important thing. Um, and again, on top of that, if you've got a long term health condition, we start worrying about the impact it's going to have on our physical health. What if it makes me worse? What if I, exercising gives me more pain? What if I'm causing problems? And again, some of us are on medication that makes engaging with exercise really, really tricky. So we say, and I know there are certain medications that make us feel very tired or make our, um, cause joint and muscle pain. So again, if we're experiencing this, engaging in physical activity is really difficult. I'm going to have a look at all of these a little bit later on, but these are things that we know are common problems. So now we want to take a moment to reflect on why physical activity matters to, to you all and to me and to Natalie, if at all. Um, we will come back to this idea, but we just wanted you to start thinking about this and prepare you for the next few steps and, and information we'll be providing. Um, so do take a moment. If you're if you're watching this in a stream, just pause the video and have a think. If you're live with us, um, we'll take a, a little bit of a moment to think about this uh, and then we can share our ideas together. Okay. And also we've got to ask, um, what do you actually know about physical activity and your health condition? Um, and also what, what would be perhaps one of the um, the barriers and um, what might happen if you do not exercise um, and also if you don't know the answer to these two questions do you know where to go to help and, and to seek advice from we also want to mention that we're not encouraging to do anything um, that your doctors or physical team has told you not to do um, we always encourage people to talk to um, the, the doctors and physical health team and make sure there's a transparent and open line communication especially with exercise And so on this next part of the workshop, we'll be talking a bit more about how to start exercising and, and uh, engaging in physical activity a bit more. So what kind of things can we start doing or start thinking about to, to keep this going? And so we'll be talking a bit more about the, our journey so far. Um, as I mentioned, we know lots of people tell you to exercise. So we're, tr we're not trying to be one of those people. Um, we know that often, physical health professionals, rather than celebrating your what you're doing right, they're telling you what you're doing wrong. So it's mainly about encouraging to about how can physical activity benefit your life. Um, and um, but also celebrating that you're doing lots of things already. Uh, managing a physical health problem is not easy. There's lots of changes. And um, so very well done for, for doing that and also for attending this workshop. Okay, so just before we move on to the next part of the workshop, if you're watching this as a stream, I want you to pause the video. I want you to stand up. If you're doing it live with us, I'm going to fidget for a moment, so bear with me. <laughs> so we are, we are trying to model this idea that we need to stand up at regular intervals, so do take that moment. Stand, stretch, top up your tea, whatever you need to do, and then come back to us, okay? So. Yeah. As Just do anything that, that will make you more comfortable uh, watching this workshop as well. Exactly. 
So as Farah mentioned earlier, we, we know that though we come across a lot of negativity, particularly when we're talking about exercise and physical activity. There are a couple of quotes on the screen that maybe you relate to. Maybe you've had these conversations with people that you love um, pe or people that you think should be there looking out for you, like your medical teams. It's really, really hard to hear these kind of conversations about exercise. And it can make us feel very overwhelmed and quite powerless when we're trying to talk to the, our teams, people that are supposed to be there to support us about the things that we're struggling with. So hopefully, Spiro and I are not gonna do this today. Hopefully we're, kind of, we're gonna come at it from a slightly different angle. But we do just wanna say that we know that some of you have experienced this before. And I just wanna reiterate how amazing the achievement is that you've still had these conversations and you've still signed on to come and talk to us today. That is an incredible achievement. Very well done. So we saw, I wanted to introduce you to someone called Christine uh, Misserandino. So she is an American um, and she lives with lupus, but she has created a particular community online um, on the website, but you don't look sick .com, And she writes about the importance of living life, even if you do have a disability or a physical health condition. Um, she was cr the creator of something called Spoon Theory, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail later on. But when she talks about why she needed to create Spoon Theory, she said that the difference between being sick and being healthy is having to make choices or to consciously think about things that the rest of the world don't have to. So I just want you to take a moment and just think about that and just think about all the different choices that you have to make and things that you have to decide in your own life that maybe other people don't need to people don't need to worry about just have a moment to think about all those things that you do okay so with that being said if we are making these different choices that people that we're talking to don't understand or have no experience of is there a way that we can talk about it with them so that they can understand so that's where something called spoon theory comes in. And I love this picture of, for spoon theory because spoon theory is so different for so many different people and it relates to so many different things. So you can use spoon theory if you have a health condition. It's also used if you have like a neurodivergence like autism or dyslexia. Um, and it's a really wonderful way of visualizing for people who have absolutely no way of understanding what we're going through. So the idea of spoon theory is that you have a limited amount of spoons per day and your spoons count as how much energy you have for that day. So everything that you do from getting up in the morning to making yourself a cup of tea to going to work to doing your job, all of these cost spoons. So think about it when you're a kid and you go, you play shops with your friends and you hand over money to receive things. Every time you do an activity, you give someone your spoons. So every morning when you wake up, you have to count your spoons and you have to go, OK, this is how many spoons I've got today. And you have to make your plan accordingly. You can't ever forget that you have spoons because you have a limited amount of spoons. So you have to always be running in the back of your mind. Have I got enough energy for this? Can I manage this today? Um, if you wake up, get it, if you suddenly wake up with a cold, you realize that your spoons have disappeared overnight. So you might normally have 15 spoons, but you wake up one day feeling ill and suddenly you've got five and you have to dramatically change your plan last minute. And you have to explain that to people that you love or people that you work with. They're just like, I'm sorry, I can't today. But if people you work with don't understand that. You never get to drop your spoons. You never, be, you never get to just be like, never mind, I'm going to do it anyway. Spoons are an essential part of your daily life that you can't get rid of because you can't ever forget that you have a health condition. It's always gonna be something that really impacts your day-to-day -day life and something that people need to be aware of. So this link, this link here um, will take you to, to a game that I think is really, really useful. I've used this with a lot of patients and their families. Um, and it's a game that talks you through how spoon theory actually works. And I highly recommend that you give this link to all the people that you love and say, okay, have a go at this and then come back to me. And it really visualizes for them how living with spoon theory actually works. OK, so if we've talked about spoon theory, we've talked about the set number of spoons. And I can imagine you're all sitting there thinking, yes, but what if I keep going? What if I what if I keep using extra spoons? So when we run out of spoons, there are two options that can happen. And you've probably experienced both of these. So the main, the first option um, probably doesn't happen as often. 
but it, we call it the crash. So you're having days, you've had a couple of days and you just keep going and you keep pushing forward and you just crash. You get very ill, you have to go home, you have to spend time in bed, you have to cancel all of your plans instead of some of your plans. And you just find that you cannot function for a period of time. So that's a crash. That's when you use all of your spoons. The other option that people do is we borrow spoons from tomorrow. So this sounds a bit crazy, but if you think if you think about when you're when you're doing something and you're really enjoying it and you think, oh, it's all right. I know I should be going home, but I'm going to I'm going to stay out a little bit later. I'm going to stay with I'm going to stay and do this activity a little bit longer. So we borrow spoons from the next day. So again, this sounds perfectly feasible and perfectly practical if we know that the spoons are going to regenerate. But when we have a long term health condition, they don't regenerate in the same way. We don't have unlimited spoons. So when we keep borrowing from the next day, this is what we end up doing. So if you can see on the slide, so we've got how much activity we're doing day to day up on the up on the um, Oh, up on the vertical side and then we've got um, and then we've got the period of time on the on our horizontal axis so when we're having a great day we do loads we keep borrowing spoons and we keep doing everything but then we crash and we have to have a couple of days in bed we have to cancel all of our plans but then we get we get another good day and we're like right okay I'm going to do I'm going to do it all again I'm going to borrow all the spoons I'm going to do all of the things but we never quite get up to that first good day. But then we crash. And this crash is going to take longer to recover. You can see these lines are getting further and further apart. We need longer and longer to help our body recover. Now, the first thing that we need to say about this is this is not specific to long term health conditions. If you think about anybody, if they go out late on a Friday night, they're going to need some time on the Saturday to recover from it. If they go out late on the Friday night, they still get up early on the Saturday to take their kids to football or whatever they have to do. And then they go out again on the Saturday night. They're going to need longer on the Sunday to recover from it. This is a perfectly natural thing to do and something that we all experience. But when we've got a long term health condition also impacting our experience, this takes longer and longer. We end up in what we call a boom and bust cycle where we find ourselves just not able to do any of the things that we want to be able to do. So that's bad. Obviously, we end up in a situation where we can't actually live our lives in a way that we want to do. And that's incredibly frustrating for us. So there are a couple of techniques that we can use to help manage our spoons. So some people um, are able to recharge one or two spoons at a time. So I used to work with a patient who used to find that sitting on a sofa and reading a book for half an hour helped her recharge one or two spoons. So if we know this works, if we know that going to bed a little bit earlier, setting our alarm a little bit later, listening to an audio book or having a cup of tea, if we know these things are going to help us recharge a little bit, then we can start scheduling in those regularly during our day to make sure that we can get to the end. But we also need to be quite serious about what we're spending our spoons on and what we think is what we think is relevant for that day. So that's where a technique that we call pacing comes in. Now, you may have heard about pacing from other health professionals. So I'm going to give you a quick overview into it today. And we're going to talk about how to use it a little bit later on. So pacing sounds very, very simple. The idea of pacing is that you set yourself limits. So again, this is the same graph that we saw for the boom and bust cycle. So on the vertical axis, we have how much energy are we using? And on the horizontal axis, we have over time. So again, if we put limits on ourselves and we say, OK, I'm only going to use the amount of energy that I would have on a bad day. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to plan everything this week as if I'm having a bad day. And we actually find that over time this will improve. But it's very, very difficult to do because we're not used to stopping ourselves. And if we're used to borrowing spoons when we're having a good day and we're thinking, right, I'm going to get everything done. I'm feeling really good today. I'm going to clean. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take Jack to football. Suddenly we have to say, actually, no, I know I'm, I'm pacing at the moment. So I know I'm having a good day, but I'm still going to stop here. I'm still going to give my body that chance to recover. So again, coming back to the idea of biological inflammation that we talked about earlier, giving your body that physical time to recover is really, really beneficial because over time, suddenly this is what starts happening. 
So we were, if we were able to keep limiting our stamina, our endurance, all start going up. And suddenly we are, and over time we were able to do a lot more with our time than we were beforehand. But this section here is really difficult to get right. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. Okay. Has anyone got any questions at this point? Does anyone want to type in the chat? Okay. So again, on that note, I would like everyone to have another fidget break. If you're watching us on the stream, again, pause, move your cushions around, go top up your tea. Anyone that's with me, feel free to do whatever makes you comfortable. If you need to move your cushions around, whatever you need. <sighs> okay. That's a slight insight into my life working from home. I do this quite regularly. <laughs> hey, so welcome back. Um, so we've had quite a lot of information from me now, so I'm going to hand over to Spiro, who's going to talk to us. Thank you, Lee. It was all, all very enlightening. So now I want to talk about person A with you. Um, so person A is 40 years old, and they have a range of conditions that made them become breathless very easily. And so they're scared of pushing themselves because they get breathless from, from the cardiac condition. Um, so things like cleaning the house or going up the stairs can be sometimes challenging because they, they exacerbate the breathlessness. And their medical team started pushing them to exercise. Explaining this uh, can be beneficial to them and can have positive results with their condition. Perhaps neglecting to say what kind of things they need to be doing or how to implement that in their lives. However, person A was terrified of exercising. Um, they fear that if they become breathless, they will have an episode and have to go to hospital. So A plan to start walking around the neighborhood for 20 minutes. And after 10 minutes of walking, they started noticing um, their breathing changing. They became worried and thought that if they continued with their walk, uh, they'll be eventually have difficulties getting air and become breathless. And as they were away from home, that meant that they would not be able to access the rescue pack or ask for support from people that they trusted. Um, so these worries made A more anxious and noticed their, their breathing become shallower and thought that their worst fear might be coming true actually. So they stopped walking and slowly made their way back home. And whenever the topic of exercise came about, A was adamant that exercise would not help them, but the opposite would make them feel worse. Even the, even the thought of course sometimes made them anxious. Um, just to illustrate what happened with A, um, we wanted to break down the problem in sections. Just to explain how the breathlessness and anxiety made, them, made the problem worse and contributed to some potential unhelpful behaviors. So um, A thought that they would be struggling to breathe, they would become breathless and no one would be able to help them. That made them feel quite anxious and worried, and that increased some of the panic symptoms. Um, a actually started having some of the symptoms because of the anxiety. So he had some, they had some faster breathing, started sweating a bit, um, his, their heart was pounding a bit, a bit faster, and they became more breathless. And so their, their worries, their thoughts, um, they, they, they thought that they were coming true. And so as a result, they walked back very slowly as so as to not um, accept themselves. And then after this, they avoided exercising or doing anything that was physical um, so as to prevent breathlessness from happening. So why was this a problem? Why, why, why might this be an issue? So A was scared of becoming breathless and something bad happened. So they started avoiding anything they thought would cause this. So the issue with this is that they started avoiding any physical activity and so they started doing less every day and over time that had an impact in their physical health as well their muscles became weaker and we know that when our muscles are weak uh, they use up more oxygen and are less efficient in achieving what we were trying to do um, which translates to becoming breathless easily and without doing something too strenuous so whenever a wants to do something um, they became more tired, used up more, more oxygen, didn't really achieve their goals, um, and that and became breathless more easily. And so the cycle repeated itself and things became worse for them because now even doing something very simple like um, going up the stairs made them even more breathless than usual. So what we're hoping to not we're hoping to not fall into such a cycle 
we're hoping to change things around or even th or just think about how to change things around. So when we increase our activity levels, that can help with breath for example. Our muscles become stronger, which means that oxygen is used more efficiently and we're able to um, uh, withstand more uh, physical exertion. So we become less breathless and our tasks become easier to, to accomplish. That means that we feel better and we're more, more, more motivated to continue being active. And so it's more of a positive cycle uh, when we compare it to the, to the other cycle that person A was experiencing at one time. So now we'll be talking a bit more about how can we put these things into practice? What kind of um, activities or tricks we can use to achieve our, our physical activity goals and, and, um, and start doing some things differently in our everyday lives? Um, before we do do that, um, let's have another fidget break. So as Natalie and I said, just do anything that will make this workshop uh, more comfortable. So maybe you might be around in your chair, um, grab, a, grab a drink, um, do some stretching if you can, take a breather, um, look away from the screen, just anything that, that could help you um, feel a bit more comfortable today. Okay, so um, how, to, how to make this happen? So in order to bring about change, we also must be aware of what it is that we were trying to do differently or work towards or towards something uh, to bring about this. This is why the idea of creating goals for ourselves is key. Having goals will give us the opportunity to visualize the change we want to see and how this can fit in our lives. So just take a moment to think about what situation you currently find yourself in. Think about what aspects you would like to change. What is the situation and what do you want to change? So what, what, what is it that you want to achieve? What's the desired outcome? So once you have a, a, an idea, we, we're not expecting you to know how to do this. Um, we hopefully will be introducing some tools that could be helpful for this. So Natalie will be introducing one of those, those tools called Smart Goals. Okay, so Smart Goals are again something that you've possibly heard from if you've spoken to your GP. Um, again, GPs often use Smart Goals when we're talking about exercise. So Smart stands for specific. So if I told you that we were that I wanted you to exercise every day, that's not very helpful. The idea of smart goals is that we have is that we are very specific about what we are going to be doing. So for a good example, if it is I'm going to go for a 10 minute walk along my road to buy the paper every morning. It's very specific. I'm saying exactly what I'm going to do. Um, M stands for measurable. Um, how can I count? Can I count how long I'm doing something for or can I count how many times I do something? So, again, if I say I'm going to go for a walk every day, that's not particularly helpful. Whereas if I say I'm going to go for a 10 minute walk and I set distance or set destination, it's very easy to say, OK, I will do this goal. And it's very much easier to achieve it if you know exactly what you are doing and how long it's going to take you to do. Um, a stands for adaptive. There is no point me setting you a goal that you aren't ready to achieve at this point so if we can't manage to walk to the 10 minutes to the news agents it's a, not a good goal unless we can adapt it slightly so is there a particular place that we can stop halfway can we say we're going to go to the shops every day but we're going to stop and we're going to sit on a bench about halfway to give our body that break so we can adapt it to where we are r stands for relevant Again, there is no point me telling you this is what you must do. You must go and run a marathon if you have no interest in running. It makes absolutely no sense to try and set goals that you are not interested in and are not going to bring you joy or pleasure to your life, which I think is some go wrong. We start thinking about exercise as specific things and we don't realise that we're actually allowed to pick and we're allowed to do things that we actually enjoy. If you do not enjoy running, don't go running. It's absolutely fine. Do something that you prefer to do instead. So again, coming back to this example of like walking to the shops every day, why would I want to do that? Well, for me, being able to walk to the shop means I get a chance to talk to the shopkeeper. It means I get a chance to talk to the people who live on my road. I get to have a look at people's gardens. Um, there is a cat that lives at number 10 and, I, and sometimes they're out in the morning. So I get to stroke the cat for a little bit. 
And it means that once I've bought my paper and I've gone home, I've actually got something to do while I sit and have my cup of tea. So again, if we're sitting recharging our spoons, it gives us something to do while we're doing that process. I can sit and I can read the newspaper or I can fill in the crossword while I'm doing that. And that gives me some me time that's really important. And the other, the last T stands for time. So again, clearly, when are you going to achieve it? There is no point in me saying I am going to run a marathon at some point in my life. I am a master procrastinator. If I say that I'm going to run a marathon at some point in my life, you will come back to me and I'll be 59. I'll be like, I'm not dead yet. I can still run that marathon. So we need to be time framed. We need to say when we are going to do it by. So again, I will go for the walk, this walk every morning and I will go out before 11. So I need I know that when it gets to 1030, I know I need to go out for my walk because I've set this time that I'm going to do it by. OK, so again, start thinking about the things that you want to do and how can we break it down into these steps? How can we adapt it so it falls into a smart goal module? OK. Very on mute. Sorry. Um, another tool we'll be discussing is activity scheduling. So we'll be talking a bit more details about this uh, soon. Um, but it's something that could be really helpful when we're trying to pace ourselves, as Natalie explained. Uh, so it's about building in behaviors in small steps um, that would give us a chance to um, feel things differently, um, have a more positive, more positive impact in, in our day. Um, and also give us a chance to um, balance the activities what we are doing, we're trying to do. Um, so maybe um, we'll be having a, a selection of things that we'll be doing in a week that, that, that equally um, adds to, the, to that. Um, so in order for us to keep track of this uh, and do this regularly, we, we can use an activity schedule or a diary uh, to keep us um, informed of um, the activities we'll be doing. Um, and we'll be turning, returning to the idea later, Natalie said. And again, just a brief thing to mention is when we're looking at the activity schedule, Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday are completely blank. This is really important for pacing. I know a lot of people feel pressure to put things in all of the boxes and it, we're going to come back to having a look at rating our activity in a, in a moment. But it's really important to remember you also need to schedule in time for rest. You need to schedule in time for recharging and for looking after yourself. So that's a really important thing to do. And if you're anything like me, you may not do that very well. So we're going to start having a look at how we can start scheduling in rest time. Okay, so there are some examples of things that we can put into our activity schedule. And again, we are trying to go for smart goals here. So what are we going to do? When are we going to do it? Where are we going to do it? Who am I going to do it with? If you need specific things to do that with. So, for example, if you want to go for a walk with a dog, I shouldn't schedule it for a time when the dog is out walking with someone else. I need to make sure that I have everything I need to achieve those goals at that point. And it's something we can make sure we arrange. And again, yoga with a friend. I need to make sure that the friend is available at that point and we have a way of connecting. So at the moment we're all working from home. We're not allowed to meet up with it, with other people. So we need to pick a time we can both be on the Internet with some space so we can do a class together. And something that we want to be aware of is the are the effects of these activities in our mood and energy levels. So we will be more inclined to commit an activity that after doing it make us feel better or make us feel like that we achieved something. So we encourage you to rate both your mood and energy levels uh, before and after your, your physical activity ex um, task. This also can help you gauge uh, whether the activity you've chosen is the correct one for you. So maybe um, running um, would maybe improve your mood, but would make you really tired afterwards. Um, so maybe walking could be a good starting point, uh, which then with pacing can, can, can increase our, our levels of energy and um, our um, levels of coping with this. Uh, and then we can work up to running at some point. And again, this is a really good point to mention that we are not expecting you to perfect this tomorrow. There are so many things that we need to practice. And the whole point behind activity scheduling at this 
is that we're going to try different things and we're going to record how we feel before and how we feel after because there may be some things that are really good for us and there may be some things that we discover that we absolutely hate and that is fine so we need to try a couple of different things and say particularly like how we feel after the exercise energetically is really important to be aware of so when are we scheduling these things in is is it worth scheduling some exercise in the morning if I know I'm going to be too tired to do my job before, um, if I'm trying if I'm exercising before work these are things that we don't necessarily know until we've tried them so this whole process is about trying some things finding what works for you and then moving it around so no one's schedule is going to look the same and that's absolutely fine um so on that note I know another issue that um, we have as humans is that sometimes achieving a goal can just seem unattainable and again, coming back to this idea of, oh, you're going to go run a marathon. You're just looking at me like, I'm, of course, I'm not going to run a marathon. I can't possibly achieve that right now. So this is where the idea of mini efforts comes in. So if we were going to run a marathon, we'd have a training regime. If we're going to fit, if we're going to complete the couch to 5K exercise program, it has steps and you do little bits at each point. And we can also break that down even further. So if we're going to go out, if we plan to go out for a walk and we're just not feeling it and we're exhausted, we can start trying to work out how to break it down. And so, like, OK, I'm not going to commit to going for a walk because I'm, I'm really not feeling very well. But maybe if I change my clothes and I put my comfortable shoes on so I can go walking, maybe I'll feel a little bit better. I'll try getting dressed. Then if we achieve that and we think, OK. I'm now dressed. I've got my shoes on. What if I just go and open the front door and I just go and have a look down the street and I see what the weather is doing and I see how I feel if I go and have a look at the front door. And then we manage that and then we think, OK, I'm now in my front garden. Maybe I will walk. I'll walk to the post box and back. Maybe maybe I don't do my whole walk today, but maybe I'm going to walk to this point and I'm going to come back. And we think, OK, well, actually, now I'm out. Now I'm walking. This is actually OK. I can I can actually do this. I think I can go on my walking route today. And this is the thing that we all go through. So we, if we know that we're going to experience this, if we can in advance know what our little mini efforts are. So getting dressed, going outside, starting walking. If we can put those plans in place before we need them. When we're having that really bad day, we know what we can logically work through to help us get to that point and help motivate ourselves when we're struggling. So something, again, we can start looking at when we look into activity scheduling. Now, on that note, we mentioned we mentioned balance and in our activity schedule. So I want you to do an exercise with me now. I want you to have a think about the last 24 hours of your life. And I want you to take a think and I want you to block out in your mind all the things that you did. If I handed you a pen and paper and said, right, write down all the things you've done in the last 24 hours, make that list. OK, now, however you want to do this, if you're doing it um, online and you're doing it with me, that's absolutely fine. I want you to have a look at that list and I want you to think I want you to pick a colour or a certain way of marking out the different tasks on your list. And I want you to have a think about which ones of those would you count as routine tasks? These are things that we have to do. So things like answering emails for work, paying bills, making appointments, pay, um, like talking to the electricity company, talking to the council. These are all routine tasks that we have to do to keep our life functioning. Things like cleaning teeth and eating can also count as routine. OK. So mark those off. Now, back to the list. I now want you to have a think about things that you did that made you that gave you a sense of achievement. So we call this mastery, but it can you can think of it as an achievement as well. What things did you do that made you proud that you'd done them, either because you did a really good job doing them or because you're really proud of yourself for actually motivating yourself to do it in the first place? So what are those things on your list give you that sense of mastery, that sense of achievement? OK, so next bit. Have a look at that list. Which of those activities did you enjoy? Which ones gave you pleasure? Was it spent with like what things did you do that you actually loved doing? Okay. And finally, I want you to have a look and I want you to tell me which of those gave you a sense of closeness with others. 
So which of them gave you that sense of social connection? Now, depending on how you've written this out on your list, if you've color coded them or you've written like little little letters next to all of them, I want you to have a look at that list. And I want you to tell me whether or not it's balanced. Because I bet, and I say if I do this myself, I know that routine takes up an awful lot of my list. And this is something that we do very naturally as humans. Now, I want you to think if each of the in life, we think of each of these four things as a leg on our table. So if you think about a table, you think it's got four different legs on it. What happens if one of those legs is considerably longer than the others? Our whole life starts feeling a little bit off kilter, right? So that's OK in the short term. Things come up and we do have to we do have to firefight in jobs or in personal lives. We do have to spend some time doing all these routine tasks to make sure that everything can stay balanced. But long term, if our table is set at this off kilter, we're going to start noticing a lot of different issues with our mental health. We're going to start feeling a lot more anxious, a lot more depressed. And we're going to start these low mood thoughts because I like we're not getting that sense of balance, mastery and pleasure from our lives. So again, if we go back to this activity schedule over here, when we're booking things in, make sure we've got that time, make sure we're doing things that we enjoy, that we're giving us pleasure, that we really that bring light to our life in a way. Okay. So now we'll talk about making a plan. So as Natalie said, we have to be aware of um, the activities we're, that we're doing and the impact that has on our lives overall and to make sure that we book the time for us to engage in this and we'll actually do it and enjoy it as well. So we've discussed the idea of creating goals and why that is helpful when trying to change things around. Now let's bring all this new acquired knowledge and think about how we can make this a reality by making a plan. Um, so maybe I can give you an example of that. Um, so I do want to start walking a bit more frequently um, it's not only something I'm doing in the moment, just because things uh, have been a bit more hectic than usual. Um, and so, as not, with Natalie's words, um, I've been engaging lots of routine things, not so much with uh, the other three. And I think walking would be something really helpful for me, because it, it would give me a, a sense of achievement, and also it'd be really helpful for my well-being, physical and emotional. So, in order to make this more specific, um, I think I want to start with a 15 minute walk around my block. Um, so that, that is specific, that's measurable. So it will be around my block, adaptive. Um, so using those acronyms. Um, so it's something that I do want to do and it, it will change my quality of life and will improve my physical and emotional health. Um, it's something very relevant because it, it will add to it. It will add to my, my life and also my goal to be a bit more fit. Um, and it will be time frame. Um, so I do want to achieve this um, perhaps um, four times a, a week um, by the end of the month. Um, so I will be using the activity schedule to book this in, uh, bearing in mind that um, I will be doing other things in the week. And so because it's something new to me, I do want to pace myself. So maybe I'll start with um, doing this twice a week. Um, also paying in mind that I'll be possibly tired from other activities, so I would be wanting some breaks in between those activities. So maybe uh, Monday I'll be quite busy and Tuesday I, I would, it would be better. So maybe I'll book the, the first one for Tuesday after work. Then Wednesday I possibly want a break. And then Thursday um, after the break I can start doing it again. And then Friday um, I will be as well quite busy. Um, so I think that's a really good way to go about it. Just think about the goal you want to be implementing by using the SMART acronym. Um, have the activity schedule there with all your other um, commitments. Peace yourself as well. Um, as Natalie was saying, um, we don't really have to achieve everything uh, immediately. We can take the time that we need to make sure that this is something that is manageable for us and also achievable. And, and also remember, um, how we feel both physically and emotionally sometimes can affect how, what we do. In those moments, it's key to remember to follow the plan and not the mood. So we've made the plan now. And um, perhaps when I come to Tuesday, I, I will feel tired, maybe a bit low as well. So um, I will have the urge not to do anything, just stay at home and, and do nothing and, and do other things that might not be quite, quite as helpful as me walking. 
Um, so our moods can be sometimes misleading. It can make us believe that we're not really able to do things. Bar barring any emergencies, so actually might make us deter from our plan. Um, we have scheduled activities for a reason. And so it can be helpful to focus on this, on the reason why we are doing it, rather than our low mood anxiety or tiredness as well sometimes. So um, that's something that I sometimes repeat myself, uh, to follow the plan, which is to walk for just 15 minutes and not the mood, which is me feeling tired maybe on a Tuesday. So again, if we're coming on to this idea of like what might stop us. So again, just have a brief pause, pause, pause the recording for a second. And I just want you to have a think. So we've now talked through a whole load of different tools that we can be using. Are there any is there anything that we've missed? Is there anything that you think still might be a bit of a problem? OK, and so I mentioned that we would come back to this slide a little bit later on. So hopefully we've now looked at some different tools and techniques that we can use to tackle some of these. So um, Spiro, do you want to start talking through how we're going to deal with some of these? Yeah, thank you. So the first one would be low mood, stress and anxiety. Um, so something that I mentioned just now is uh, when we're having a plan there in place is to follow the, the plan, not the mood. But sometimes it's not as easy. So you're hopefully already with a therapist in our service. And if not, if that is something you might want to think about as well. Um, so having those uh, those goals in place and uh, making them smarter um, and, and, and um, scheduling things in, in a week. Um, and also being aware that um, these things will help improve uh, low mood, stress and anxiety over time. Um, unfortunately, this might not happen immediately. It might take a bit of time to, for, the, for this to happen, for you to see if it can change. And on that note, again, if you're feeling like with, you're struggling with a lack of support, you can either reach out to your therapists about um, different areas that maybe we can start using some assertive communication, which we do have some workshops on, and we're going to link you to that at the end of the presentation. But we've also talked about spoon theory and pacing and ways of explaining to our loved ones and to our medical teams what we're going through and being able to go back to our medical teams and say, look, I hear what you're saying, but it's not working for me. We need to start thinking, we need to start adapting it for me. Sometimes also we don't really prioritize physical activity. Um, I'm sure that most of you are already juggling lots of things in your, in your, in your lives. And so physical activity um, and exercise might not be something that you're thinking about putting on the top of your list. So um, something that can help us or help you tackle this is um, just just making a look, having a look at what you're doing at the moment, um, and think what would be realistic to start doing and start changing. So having having some goals, having an idea of what you're trying to achieve, making that specific, um, and trying to start implementing that in your week. Um, doesn't have to be uh, your top priority, but it can be one of those things that you're thinking about doing. And you can you can start very slowly with one thing on a week, and then if you if you see that it really helps, you can implement that. And again, if we again we're talking about worries about physical health, so obviously Spiro and I we are not experts on your physical health. You are, um, but there are a whole team of people around you that you can talk to if there are things that you're all struggling with. So you should, if you've got pulmonary conditions, you should have access to things like pulmonary rehab, cardiac gyms. Talk to your GPs about what support is available for your specific conditions. And again, if you want to start exercising but you're worried, you can track down personal trainers that are actually trained to deal with specific long-term conditions so there are options of experts that you can build on if you can't find the support that you need in, um, at home yeah and um also being aware that um your chronic conditions might have an impact on your health as well, um might have an impact on what you're doing um it does take a lot to manage this so it depletes resources um just just remembering spoon theory and pacing um we need to be planning activities uh, in advance because um, we also need to be aware of um, how things like going to appointments, um, dealing with our chronic conditions um, and medication that Natalie will talk about now uh, can deplete us from our resources. And um, we need to be, I guess, a bit more intelligent about when we're booking things in and um, acknowledging that actually having a health problem is impactful in, uh, in what we're doing. And so as Thora mentioned, um, medication has a massive impact on how we're feeling physically. I used to work with a patient who took um, a chemotherapy drug. Um, they weren't taking it for cancer related reasons. They were taking it for something else, but they take it every Sunday night. 
And we realised during the course of our treatment sessions that 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 meant that Monday morning was a complete write off. They used to feel so exhausted and so tired on a Monday morning that trying to get up was just too much work. So we we made a note of it and we started planning in our schedules around that. So we used to not plan anything until Monday at two o'clock. So she had that little bit longer in bed to recover and be able to build that in. So once you know how your medication is impacting you, you can start scheduling around it. So again, spoon theory, if you know that these pills are going to take four of your spoons, that's OK. We can work around that. And again, pacing, talking to people around us about, OK, I'm sorry, I can't on Monday. I re- Monday's not a good day for me. Um, I feel really ill on Monday mornings. Can we meet on Tuesday? Talking to people about what we need to get our needs met. Um, on that note, there is a whole um, specialist team around you. We've spoken to some of them. Uh, we've spoken about some of them already, but we spoke with the dietitian things about exercise and common pitfalls that people fall into with exercise um so one of the couple of things that we wanted to mention briefly is just the idea that people have that exercise burns all of the calories possible um is something that we need to be quite aware of exercise alone is never going to combat a bad diet so just something to be aware of and if you do need um being making sure that you're only eating when you're hungry so appetite and hunger taking control if we're failing quite low we can sometimes reach out for comfort food again we start over complicating changes we start worrying about so many different things and trying to make all of the plans all at once and that's an awful lot to manage so again if you talk to your gp get access to a dietitian if you think you need one there are a couple of websites here that might be really helpful for you and there's a couple of like community groups out there that are really wonderful at supporting you in these journeys if you do want to start getting into better shape so there's a couple there that you can have a look at as well so now we also want to ask you um what other barriers might there be um just take a bit of time to reflect on this question. Um, so we've already mentioned a few of them, but maybe there's things that we weren't able to think about and maybe something that from your personal experience that is a barrier. Um, so do take a moment to think about this and or any questions you have, any concerns or disagreements from all these ideas and, and tools that we've introduced today. Um, so if you're watching this um, from, from the web, uh, do you, you make a note of this and try to think about how to overcome this by using some of the tools and techniques and all the information we've um, given you. If you're here with us uh, live, um, let's have a discussion on this as well. What can we do better? How can we overcome this? OK, and in terms of moving forward, so obviously we are it, we are just here for about an hour or so. We're not we are not going to be able to change lives today. We're not going to be able to solve this tomorrow. So we just thought of a couple of things that we think about are going to be really important for moving forwards with this journey. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to talk to your GP and your medical team. Um, you need to find out what exercise or physical activity is appropriate for you to start doing. There are some conditions that will mean that certain things are not appropriate for you. So we cannot advise on that, but you can talk to your GP and your medical teams and find out what is and isn't good for you to be doing. You can start making an activity tracker and focus on the things that make you feel better or feel worse. Don't think about it in terms of like calories burnt or anything like that. Just think about how does it make you feel? Um, like have a look at when you struggle most. So are there certain points in the day that you just don't want to be doing certain things? And can you adapt your schedule to allow that? And again, making sure that we are balancing. So if you are finding yourself being put, pulled much more towards routine activities, making sure you can bring that balance back and having it all on paper and colour coding it, putting stickers in, however helps you make sure you've got that balance going, however you, helps you visualise. So the other thing that we need to start doing is having a go at pacing. As I mentioned, a lot of people struggle when they first start pacing. I know um, when I've tried pacing myself for certain activities, I get really frustrated with it because I think, oh, but I'm feeling good today. I should definitely be, be trying harder. So have a go. Remember to yourself, no, I am pacing. I'm going to set these goals and I'm going to try and stick to them. And if you are struggling, come back and talk to your therapist. That's what your team is here for. We're here to support you with all of this. 
So on that note, um, we are going to be running a similar workshop in a few weeks time. Um, you all have the option of coming back to us. And if you come back to us with your activity trackers and how you've got on with pacing, we can have a group discussion about what worked, what didn't work and what you need a little bit more help with, because you are the experts in how you manage this. Spiro and I can guide you, but you yourselves are the experts on how to live with these conditions. So we can help each other move forwards if you want to be doing that. And on that note, I just want to mention this slide. Um, so I'll be asking you all um, to take two minutes to answer these three questions. Um, so what three things are you going to take away from today? How can you put all of this into practice or just the things that you found helpful? And is there anything that you could do to remember what you've learned? So maybe you can take a piece of paper and a pen and start writing things down now. Um, so if you are watching this live, we'll give you a moment. If you're watching from a web, just pause the video and um, start writing. OK, and just on that note, we've got three major points that we think we need to take away from today. The first one is that practice makes perfect. Again, we as coming back to this marathon analogy. There is no way I can run a marathon tomorrow. I'm going to need a lot of time and a lot of practice and a lot of full starts before I get to that point. So the important thing is to keep trying. And when you have a bad day, take that moment to reflect on what happened, what got in your way and what can we plan in to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So keep going, keep having keep having a couple of tries and you'll come back and you will you'll discover that over time this does get a lot easier. On that note, please don't try and make all of the changes tomorrow. Um, everyone, particularly New Year's Eve, is a wonderful one where everyone decides that they're going to change their life immediately and they're going to cut out all carbs and do all this exercise. And it lasts about a week. You cannot overhaul your life in a very short space of time. It's a lot long term learning and developing these habits. So we need to give ourselves that time to make that change. Again, marathon training. You cannot train for a marathon in 24 hours. You need to give yourself that six months to do all the training, to do all of the practice and to build it into your schedule. Make sure you're being, giving yourself that time to make those changes. And the final thing on that note is be kind to yourself. You have so many negative voices coming from so many different people. Try and make sure that there isn't one coming from you as well. We are we know that this is going to take a long time and we know that it's going to be quite challenging. So make sure that you are trying to be kind to yourself. And if you do have a bad day, think, OK, I did have a bad day, but I know what went wrong. I know maybe next time I'll try this. Uh, maybe next time I can put this in place instead and make sure you're being kind to yourself and you're giving yourself the achievement that you deserve because you are making massive changes and you need to acknowledge that as well. Even if they're not happening as fast as we want, ideally we need to be patient and give ourselves that compassion that we need. So on that note, there are a couple more resources here for you. So we've mentioned assertiveness. Um, so there is a pre-recorded we um, webinar on assertiveness on the same place that you found us. So please go and have a look at that. If you're struggling with talking to your medical teams or talking to your loved ones, it's a really good resource for you. Again, perfectionism. If you're trying pacing and you're struggling with it, have a look at the perfectionism. Have a look at why it's OK sometimes to not be as perfect as we want to be able to be. Um, there are a whole load of self-help workshops and resources on our website. Here's the link here. There are loads of NHS resources that you can get access to, some post-COVID exercise resources that we've got. And again, down here, things like Sport England, um, Getting Active at Home, and We Are Undefeatable is an amazing website about getting active with physical health conditions. So again, go and have a look at those in your own time. And you're hopefully already linked with a therapist uh, in your service, but if you're not, um, please contact us. So this is the uh, information um, to get in touch. So you can either call us, uh, you can go to our website, or you can ask your GP for advice on how to refer to our service. Um, so it's Camden and it's into Psychological Therapy Services. And um, yeah, me and Natalie want to thank you very much for your time today. Uh, it, it has been a very long workshop, lots of information. So it definitely makes sense that you won't remember everything, but hopefully you'll be taking a few notes uh, from the things that you found helpful and the, and the three things you're taking away. Um, 
And one last request is to please fill in the feedback form we'll be sending to you just to make sure that we are doing our best. And if not, um, we can find out other ways to improve this workshop for people. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for attending today. Well done. Thank you. So again, just coming back to this idea that we are not experts. Um, we are not living with these physical health conditions. So if you think we've missed something quite major, please let us know. We are developing these workshops and we're trying to learn from you as well. So please give us your feedback so we can try and make this as useful for everybody as possible. OK. And then the last bit, we've had some resources that we've referred to through this. So if you want to go and check anything that we've said or any of the science behind it, all of the references are there for you. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to hearing from you soon. <laughs>